Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation. This time on Colores, Santa Fe painter Erin Cohn plays with human gesture and abstracting form. I think I'm very interested in the, the composition and the pure form and distilling the realism just as a way to heighten its expressive power. Designer Charles James brings poetry to fashion design. I think what would be great for people to take away from this exhibition is to think about the conceptual aspects of a fashion designer. The Rubin Museum highlights Himalayan deities who guide and protect believers on the path to enlightenment. Peaceful deities in general are pleasing. They wear a beautiful ornamented dress. Wrathful deities have a terrifying expression and they emanate flames. K-12 Gallery and Tejas, an art center in Dayton, Ohio, creates positive direction for at-risk children. Just a little seed of inspiration can really change a person's life and many other people's lives too. It's all ahead on Colores. Painter Aaron Cohn uses gesture and abstraction to create visual impact. I love a strong visual impact. I love taking all the context and the narrative away. I love the isolation of the figure in space, you know, very similar to the negative space around a sculpture, the empty stage around a dancer. I love how evocative the human form can be in that isolation. When I started kind of reevaluating the role of fashion and clothing in my work, I started being really interested in the idea that I could treat clothing just like any other abstract element I'm using. So it could just be purely form and color and line and I could just utilize it that way. And what would happen was kind of interesting because I was trying to stay focused as an artist on what I was seeing and then sometimes it would uh, switch gears and I would be evaluating as a woman in today's society and starting to look at like, oh, hey, that's a great dress. I'd like to have that dress. And I have to shift gears back to the artist and think like, oh, wait, let's look at those shapes and forms again. And, you know, I start looking at the model's pose and gesture and their figure. And then I start thinking, darn, I wish I was that thin or something, you know, and comparing myself. It was interesting to notice that I would get pulled that direction because as I'm painting the female figure, I don't really think of it as painting a woman. I'm just thinking that's the human form. I happen to do female imagery because I think I just relate to it more and because I started from a place of self-portraiture. The way I've used clothing on the figure has really evolved. I did a series of paintings of my husband and I was kind of going for an everyman aesthetic so I put him in just a plain white dress shirt and I really loved what happened about keeping it timeless, keeping it unobtrusive so the focus was not on the clothing. And then later on when I got a female model I started putting her in the white dress shirt because I just enjoyed what was happening there. I was really happy with the exploration of the forms and it was working for me. And then after doing a large series like that, an interesting thing started to happen where I was getting feedback from people seeing the work, asking me what my big fascination was with androgyny, with gender roles, why I was putting the female and male clothing. And it was really eye-opening because I hadn't thought of that at all. I just, I get so focused on the pure abstract content and I was just really enjoying what the clothing did, you know, by keeping it minimal, just fabric folds, just shapes with which I could compose. When I got that feedback, I kind of decided to reevaluate what I was doing with the clothing, and I realized I'd been a little bit unnecessarily afraid of, you know, I didn't want to capture a specific fashion, and I, I wanted to keep the focus on the figure, on the gesture, on the pose. So the first thing I wanted to do was convert it to something more feminine, a more feminine aesthetic, because I hadn't ever meant to be so far away from that. I just, I was focusing on the female figure and not thinking about what the clothing did to that but by adding that element with the clothing, it actually gave me a lot more to work with abstractly, which is what I'm always so interested in.
The subject is purely realistic, but it's within a framework of pure design, so I consider the composition, I consider that kind of as fundamental more than, than the subject. Like, I'm not worried about portraiture. Portraiture doesn't interest me, the idea of capturing a particular psychology at work in that person. I want to use the human form as the element I'm designing with. We read body language, we look at pose and gesture, and we ascribe meaning and sense a story in that pose in, in what we're seeing there. So I'm trying to keep things very undefined and open because the human figure automatically emotes. There's nothing you have to do to create that. I like anything that flattens the realism. I like to take something that looks totally realistic and you look closer and you say, wait a minute, the background's coming into the figure, how can that be? Or there's something overlapping and it doesn't meet up, what's happening there? One thing I really like to achieve is a sense of harmony and balance where every part, every little abstract element, every compositional piece is coming together in such a way that it, it actually enhances every other part of it. And when that happens, it creates a certain harmony that I like, but I also like with the figure and with the placement and with these visual glitches to create an element of tension and awkwardness too that you look for. It's, it's how we view reality too. I mean, you can think things are really stable and you trust what you're seeing with your eyes and then something comes up that makes you question it. Or emotionally, you know, you think you've got it all figured out and something comes along and it turns it on its side. I'm thinking of it the way Degas said, the artist does not draw what he sees, but what he must make others see. I think I'm very interested in the, the composition and the pure form and distilling the realism just as a way to heighten its expressive power. There's a notion in the art world these days that you know, painting is dead, realism is dead, beauty is dead, and I think those are all ridiculous thoughts. Those things have been around since the beginning of art forms, and I think they'll always be around. And one thing I'm specifically doing is showing people that there is something contemporary and fresh to say in those realms. You don't have to go far from that, and you can still say something meaningful. For me, the painting process is just extremely intuitive, and I'm thinking so much about how to get the vision in my head onto the canvas that I, I'm not leaving any time to think about a big meaning behind it or symbolism or anything like that. As an artist, I think my job is to create something so visually striking that people will stop and look at it and they'll think about it. You know, I think it needs to be something that grabs and it, it is operating on a purely visual level. I think that the best thing an artist can do is not be concerned what other artists have done or what other artists are doing. Just stay open to what's motivating them and get their vision out there because if you don't get it out there, it'll never exist. Avant-garde designer Charles James was obsessed with the curve. Charles James is considered one of America's first couturiers, perhaps America's only couturier, and he rose to prominence during the 1940s and 50s with his very avant-garde fashion designs. James had created this theory of a wall of error between the body and fabric. He felt it was one of his greatest achievements as a fashion designer. Um, so a wall of error, thinking about uh, proximity, relationships between people, uh, architecture, and this idea in James's fashion design itself. John and Dominique de Manil uh, were art collectors. Uh, they came from France and they arrived in the United States in the 1940s, settling in Houston in 1944. 
I think once Dominique de Menil met Charles James and became privy to his work, she immediately saw him as an artist. The exhibition opens up with this stunning dress, uh, this red concert gown. James often referred to it as the March of Dimes dress. It's approximately from 1949. It was designed for a March of Dimes gala. It's an excellent example of James's work. It's a fusion of Victorian design um, aesthetics and uh, forms with a very sort of modern, artistic, forward-looking uh, mashup of materials. One of the earliest pieces in the collection is a reefer coat from 1947. It's a beautiful example of this idea of a wall of air. It uh, drapes away from the body in the back, creating that space between the body and the fabric. Another dress in the exhibition is called the Infanta cocktail dress. It is a uh, brown, not an, a usual color for a cocktail dress. Um, so this was very James again, uh, sort of unusual colors one wouldn't expect. There's a gorgeous ball gown known as the bustle dress. And it is again this interesting combination of materials with uh, sort of a brown uh, wool crepe uh, bustle wrapped around the back of the dress, very Victorian again. And then you have this unusual mix of colors and materials, velvet with brown wool and, uh, and then uh, satin. So again, his sort of unusual mix of materials with colors uh, and then historical references uh, that make his garment so unique. So in the Deminal home, James not only created furniture for the house, but he also intervened in the uh, structures of the house, um, not necessarily architecturally, but on the surface of them. He uh, sort of wallpapers with felt that he's dyed uh, butterscotch, uh, intense fuchsia, even just plain white felt. And it creates a texture and uh, sort of a richness of color that I don't think one would achieve otherwise with paint. He's always, uh, again, obsessed with the idea of the antique, the old, something that has a patina to it. So the colors are slightly dirty. And in the hallway, he uses a bubblegum pink. And then uh, in her dressing room, he paints a beautiful checkerboard of airy colors, aqua pale blue, gray. And these are some of the, the color introductions that he brings into the house on the, on the structural surfaces. You see a relationship between his fashion design and the way he thinks about interior design. James was obsessed with the curve. He was obsessed with the idea of the female body and its curvature. And this is very much exemplified in the pieces of furniture you see in the exhibition, one of which is a chaise long. And again, these sort of refined materials combined with the rough hewn. So the legs are done out of a, a, a wrought iron. But the shape is like a female body. There is the lip sofa, perhaps Charles James's most iconic piece of furniture. It was designed originally for the de Manils, and it was completed in 1952. Looks like a pair of lips. Another piece is uh, the banquette. It's a large sweeping sofa that resided in the de Menil's dining room for lounging uh, after dinner or um, while one is entertaining. I think what would be great for people to take away from this exhibition is to think about the conceptual aspects of a fashion designer. What I think is beautiful about Charles James is that he brings a poetry to fashion design. And this is, to me, what James was about and the commission of the de Menils, uh, of James was about, was this idea of living in life and how fashion um, elaborates that, but it also becomes a mechanism for the poetic. Rare artworks from Asia show the interrelationship of cultures. 
I'm Christian Lutzernitz. I'm senior curator at the Rubin Museum of Art. I curated the exhibition Masterworks, Jewels of the Collection, which showcases mostly paintings and sculptures of the collection in the Rubin Museum from the 8th up to the 20th century and shows them in their international relationship from India across the Himalayas into the East Asia, China and Mongolia. The exhibition changes once per year and each rotation has a different theme. The present rotation now has the theme of wrathful and protective deities. In the Indian and Himalayan context, one differentiates between deities according to their appearance and their symbolism that is associated with them. Peaceful deities in general are pleasing. They wear a beautiful ornamented dress. Wrathful deities have a terrifying expression and they emanate flames. Since most of the works that we show are from Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism is most strongly represented. This is a form of esoteric Buddhism or tantric Buddhism that developed late in India and then became adopted in Tibet. One of the kind of signature elements of Tibetan Buddhism is the emphasis on the teacher and on the teaching transmission. And in the mandala of Amogapasha, uh, we see the teaching transmission uh, represented at the top of the painting. The most important teachings of Tantric Buddhism are transmitted orally and have not been written down. The mandala really derives from the concept of purified ritual space so in the outer region, you have a fire circle and a vajra circle that purify the space on one hand, but also protect it from evil influences. And once it's ritually purified and offerings are given, you can invite the deity to abide in that space temporarily, for example, for a consecration of a stupa or a temple, or for the initiation of the pupil, which is a very important part of the esoteric Buddhist transmission. Teacher portraits are one very frequent topic within uh, Tibetan Buddhist art. Since the veneration of the teacher is even considered higher than the veneration of the deity, because without the teacher you would not uh, be able to practice a certain deity. The ivory sculpture of Lachok Senge represents the ninth abbot of Ngoa Monastery, which is in South Central Tibet. He holds a, a large flaming jewel, which represents the Buddhist teaching that he transmits. And the right hand uh, performs a gesture of fearlessness. In the Tibetan sculptural tradition, it's extremely rare to have an ivory sculpture. That material, of course, had to be imported and is very precious. At the entrance of uh, the gallery, we have a marvelous sculpture of one of the four great kings. These are guardian deities of the four directions. They are represented on the outside of uh, temples to ward off evil influences. This one is called Virupaksha, his name meaning evil eye. And in fact, the stone inlays of his eyes make it appear almost alive. The sculpture presumably comes from one of those regions where Tibetan culture meets Chinese culture. It's approximately uh, 17th or 18th century. It's an extremely rare object in Western museums because it's made of clay. The four great kings weren't really made for transport. They are heavy and they are very fragile. And uh, it's a miracle in this case that uh, the sculpture not only preserves the two attributes uh, held in the hand, a uh, victory banner in the stupa, but also the scarf that floats behind his head. We have only uh, discussed a few objects uh, of this uh, exhibition, Masterworks Jewels of the Collection. 
there is much more to explore about the interrelationships of the different countries that are represented in this exhibition and I hope you have the chance to visit the exhibition and see it yourself. K-12 Gallery in Tejas works to inspire at-risk children. Dream and vision can be coupled with another person's strategic plan. Strategic plans and vision. That's what creates innovation. Dayton is known as a town of innovation and invention with an abundance of great engineers. But rarely do we group innovation and art together. K-12 Gallery in Tejas is working to change that. I think what sets us apart from any other sort of center is that we're not afraid to take risks in our projects. So we have these great, really creative, large-scale projects that we do. We're fortunate here in Dayton to have so many creative outlets. We provide this one-of-a-kind experience for people, so they really can get creative and get messy here and not have so many of the boundaries that I think other places provide. In 1993, Jerry Standard was inspired to start the K-12 Gallery after visiting a children's art festival in State College, Pennsylvania. She was a first-year art teacher for Dayton Public Schools. Just a little seed of inspiration can really change a person's life, and many other people's lives, too, in the process. Once people are really inspired to do things, to move, to move in a positive direction, other things come about. The really cool thing about this program is that we have kids in here from every area, every background, every race. We serve everybody. The depth of what we do all is surrounded by the inner city kid. And those inner city kids aren't necessarily all coming from Dayton anymore. There's West Carrollton, there's Xenia, there's Kettering, and these, these pockets of children that have lower resources than what we have are coming from all over. And uh, they attend our artist and training program. And that's every day after school. We train their right brain to use their creative energy in a positive direction. The gallery has a great scholarship program to assist those who may not have the ability to pay for an art class. Going one step further, the gallery is also in partnership with the Montgomery County Juvenile Court, encouraging youth to express themselves in more constructive ways. HALO is the brainchild of Jerry Standard, um, and HALO stands for Helping Adolescents Achieve Long-Term Objectives. Basically, at that time, the levees were failing, Dayton Public Schools was losing their arts programming, and Jerry has always seen that there has been a lack of art services for at-risk youth. So she reached out to us and had the idea for the HALO program. Judge Koontz and Judge Capizzi and our probation directors have always been supportive of alternative programming like this. We are a strength-based court, so we believe that what works for one kid may not work for another. So if we can expose them to different um, elements in the community, uh, such as arts or theater, those sort of things, then hopefully we can light a spark in them and find their passion. And in turn, they start to feel good about themselves and give back to their community. We have teams that come in and work on large-scale public art. We have about 15 large-scale public murals that went up in the last couple of years. And so we're working on our third phase this year. They learn about not only skills like team building and working in a group, but they get that one-on-one -on -one instruction. And when they are committing crimes, they aren't thinking about the community as a whole and what they're doing in that moment. But when they come in and they do these large-scale paintings, and then we put them up on abandoned buildings in the community, they start to take ownership for their community. And we make a big deal out of these unveilings. I mean, we invite the city commissioners, the sheriffs, the mayor. We want everybody to come down and celebrate what these kids are doing. So when they see that everybody's coming out for them, they start to feel good about themselves and realize, I'm part of a bigger pi picture here. I, I can make a difference in the community. And then when I get through that window, there's still more possibilities of that person. They are building friendships. They are building a network system that we today don't even know how it will impact our community or the world in the future. We just, we don't know how those connections will impact the bigger picture. K-12 Gallery in Tejas has some big plans for their new location on Jefferson Street. It includes revolving exhibitions, new glass and darkroom studios, 
and a one-of-a-kind artist's market. With our new space, the walls and the space itself can be utilized by so much more than what we had in our old space. We could do large-scale installations here. We could do large exhibitions of different types of sculptures or pottery. The potential is endless, and that's really exciting to all of us. You're going to find something new, and you're going to see uh, us reinvent ourselves, along with the help of hundreds of artists that uh, come and go from K-12 and Tejas every day. Next time on Colores. It was the most historic kiss that never was. Nationally recognized slam poet and Albuquerque's poet laureate Jessica Helen Lopez shares her inspiration and a performance. Cut the breeze to tickle my nose. I want to talk more about the personalized story versus uh, the abstract kind of headline glossy um, vocabulary. No make believe wife playing a house behind the kissing. Installation artist Jonathan Latiano creates works with themes of evolution and extinction. I like this kind of pairing of art and science, specifically fields of science that deal with large expanses of time. Through photographing buildings and their artifacts, Paul Bialis brings to life the stories of iconic Wisconsin breweries. Just walking into that room for the first time and seeing what was there and what could be saved on film and the story it told, to me, was an amazing, amazing thing. Austrian artist Heimrad Becker dedicated his life to documenting the remnants of Nazism and the Holocaust. So Becker was always a poet and a photographer at the same time. Until next time, thank you for watching. Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation.